To introduce this episode of An American Gallery, here is Lorne Green. America has nine national memorials. They're as varied in their appearance as the history they honor. The last of the nine is carved on a 6,200-foot granite mountain in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's known both as the Four Faces and, more properly, Mount Rushmore. It was sculpted by an American genius named John Gutson Borglum, and the beauty of its mass promises to last an eternity as a monument to the American ideal. This, then, is the story of two giants, Borglum, the sculptor, and Mount Rushmore, one of our national memorials. John Gutson Borglum, sculptor, saluted this week on An American Gallery. Ed Begley stars as Gutson Borglum in A Story of Two Giants. Lincoln. Hit it like the babe would. Here she comes. My fastball. Home run, Dad. Home run. Good hit, son. All right, babe Ruth. Come and help me find the ball in these shrubs. Did you see it fail, Dad? I'm hitting almost as good as you. Uh, but you'll have to admit, your old man still pitches better. Right, Lincoln? Oh, sure. But you play professional ball. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Lincoln, uh, since you're now 12 years old... Twelve and a half. I think it's time I made a confession. I never played professional ball. I mean, you know as well as I do, I was born in Iowa. Now, what teams does Iowa have in the National or American League? None, Dad. Not a single one. You see, son, sometimes a father who spends all his time carving statues likes to be the kind of hero his son can look up to. So you made up the story about playing professional ball. I... Oh, yes. You're not disappointed? I haven't been for about three years. Ever since I found out that the Yankees come from New York and not Iowa. (laughs) You devil, you. Get out of here. Oh, no. No, never mind. Never mind. We've got a brand new baseball to find. Yes, sir. Next, you'll be telling me about the birds and the bees. Dad, something fell out of your pocket. Huh? I got it. It's a telegram. Oh, yes. I meant to read that. August 20th, 1924. Huh? South Dakota. That's a state, there. I know it's a state, Lincoln. It's just that I don't get many telegrams from South Dakota. There's a North Dakota, too. Look for the ball. Dear Mr. Borglum, by way of brief introduction, I am historian for the state of South Dakota. Good for you. In my opinion, our Black Hills offer unique opportunity for heroic sculpture of unusual character. Would it be possible for you to design and supervise a massive sculpture there? Are we going to South Dakota? That ball cost me 75 cents. Find it. Uh, The proposal has not passed beyond the mere suggestion, but if it be possible for you to undertake the matter, I feel quite sure we could arrange to finance such an enterprise. Yours, Don Robinson. Twenty-three skidoo. We're going, I can tell. This could be the ball game, the pennant, the series. Heroic sculpture. I've seen those hills, son. And this man Robinson is right. Now, run and tell your mother to change her canning schedule and to start thinking about what to pack for South Dakota. Watch your step there, Lincoln. I'm okay, Dad. And I'm not much of a geologist, Mr. Borgen, but they tell me most of these mountaintops are granite. Good for sculpting. What's this area called, Mr. Robinson? That's the Harley Range. These sharp granite shafts are called the needles. Breathtaking. God's own sculpture. Mm Mm-hmm. Question is, Mr. Borglum, are you sculptor enough to compete with him? He is, sir. You're both talking blasphemy. Yes, yes. Perhaps compete was the wrong word, but we do need an artist big enough to handle this project. As I recall, it was you who sent me the telegram. My mom says Dad's a genius when it comes to the emotional value of volume. Tell the man what that means, Lincoln. He loves me. I know what it means. And, Mr. Borglum, I I should point out, it's not I who am concerned. Many important people, including Senator Norbeck, are concerned that you'll damage the beauty of these needles. Robinson, famous I'm not. 
Michelangelo, I'm not, nor am I a man of destruction. These needles, they're like cathedrals. No, I wouldn't carve here. Hmm? But there, on the next range. Mount Rushmore? Whatever you call it. We should look around there. Dad, I'm getting cold. Oh, here. Stand close to me. You know, the weather in this altitude isn't entirely hospitable. You, uh, don't want to be able to work from, say, spring to November, or perhaps December. I always felt the bear knew what he was doing when he hibernated in the winter. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking, and uh, perhaps the great sculpting of an Indian. Oh, and... don't be so provincial, Mr. Robinson. Well, granted, art in America should be American, drawn from American sources, memorializing American achievement, but an Indian isn't enough. This must depict the spirit. The ideals of our geographical expansion, our political development. Well, you have a concept? Well, not yet, but... Well, we'll have to make surveys. We'll need around $10,000 to begin with. You think that me... Oh. Oh, we're not alone. What? I don't believe it. Myra Jackson. What's a Myra Jackson? Our enemy. Wife of a local newspaper editor. She has everyone convinced that sculptors are butchers out to carve up these needles. You look surprised, Mr. Robinson. Oh, well, I... To me, climbing these hills is like a preview of an ascent to heaven. Save us, dear Lord. <laughs> uh, good morning, Myra. May I present Mr. Gutson Borglum and his son, Lincoln? Oh, Mr. Borglum, I'm here representing those people of South Dakota who will not have you disturbing one of God's miracles. Mrs. Uh, Jackson, it would seem that one of God's miracles already seems disturbed. It's apparent, Mr. Borglum. You consider me some kind of an unnecessary irritant to your, uh, carving plan? On the contrary, Mrs. Jackson, you're quite necessary. For without the likes of you, how could we ever gauge what a horrible example can be? Mr. Robinson, <coughs> is this the kind <coughs> of man... The altitude, Myra. Mr. Borglum is unaccustomed to it. Nonsense. I take to heights like an eagle. Or a vulture. She talked you, Dad. Shut up. Now, we're all being a little premature. Or immature. You're even now. Shut up, I say. My husband will fight this scheme all the way. The power of the press. Dwindles in your awesome shadow, Mrs. Jackson. Have you ever considered dieting? I've heard quite enough. But I assure you, Mr. Baldwin, you've heard nothing yet. Wow. And I thought my teacher had fat left. Lincoln, that's no way to talk about a lady. But I thought you didn't like her. I'm talking about your teacher. Well, Mr. Baldwin, you've met the first obstacle. Yes. Well... He's right to know. What? About the needles. As I said before, we can't touch them. But that Rushmore, it looks ideal. Well, let's not tell her I agree in principle. She might grow to like me, and that would be positively unbearable. I just heard. They passed us. Jesse, don't you realize I'm taking a bath? Well, of course. Sculpting's messy work. But... I relish privacy. I am naked. So are half of your statues. Gutson, did you hear? I, I am flesh and blood. I'll get you a fig leaf. Gutson, in the name of heaven, listen to me. They've passed the bill. What bill? What bill? What bill, he asked? Exactly. <laughs> the bill. South Dakota. Oh? The Senator Norbeck, who got Senator Williamson to introduce the bill in Congress... So the giant statues could be carved in the Harney National Forest. They passed it? It became law yesterday, March 23rd, 1925. Then we've got the money. Well, uh, not exactly. And we don't even know if it is we. My dear friend, since you have me trapped in this tub with my bare essentials, will you have the decency to unfurl the red tape you're hinting at? The measure calls for plans being submitted to the Commission on Fine Arts. No. I know what that commission would do with the ideas I have brewing. Next. The South Dakota State Legislature. There'll be a problem because the bill calls for them to appropriate $10,000. What else? Well, Governor Gunderson is against it. So we're no closer than we were a year ago. Senator Norbeck thinks the state legislature might go for 5000 Those parsimonious Black Hill billies. That chance. Well, the Andy Borglum bandwagon seems to be stretching halfway across the continent. Which reminds me. What do you mean, we don't even know if it's we? Well, the sculptor wasn't specified in the legislation. And Michelangelo thought he had problems. Well, maybe if you were more specific with your ideas and talked with Robinson or Norbeck, you could give them new ammunition, new inspiration. You may be right, Jesse. Let me think about it. 
Dad, Mom said the queen towels weren't dry yet. You have to use the one here. No, no matter, Lincoln. I may just stay here, go on a bathtub strike, remain submerged until the right people realize our nation needs fewer flappers and more monuments. Dutton, I found the clean towel. Well, don't just stand there, dear. Come on in. I think we've got enough now for a game of Mahjong. Well, I'm afraid we're fighting a losing battle, Borgman. Right on one count, wrong on the other. Mm -hmm. We're fighting, yes, but a battle isn't lost until it's over. Well, I can't decide whether you're stubborn or dedicated. I'm both, Robinson. This is the mightiest nation in the world, and we don't have a monument bigger than a snuff box. This American civilization is expanding, exploding. It demands an enlarged dimension, a whole new scale. Our monument should announce to the whole world the character, the vitality, the dynamics of our philosophy. A monument's dimension should be determined by the importance to civilization of the events commemorated. Not by the parochial leanings of some state legislators and a, a Myra Jackson. Oh, uh, which brings us to the events commemorated. When you called, you said you knew whom you wanted on Rushmore. Yes, four men. A memorial to the builders of this nation. Washington, obviously. Mm -hmm. No one man contributed more to our independence than Jefferson. You see why, don't you? He's symbolic of our continental growth. Yes, his purchase of the Louisiana Territory. The kind of expansion that's made us big enough to defend our freedom. Well, I can't imagine much argument there. And will anyone argue with Lincoln? He preserved this union. And the fourth? Theodore Roosevelt. Uh Uh-oh, now that could give us problems. Robinson. With the Panama Canal, he made us an ocean-to-ocean republic. He fought for the highest standards of political morality. And Senator Norbeck suggested him because he approved of Roosevelt's trust-busting activities... And Roosevelt once lived on a ranch in Dakota. You're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. I would never have thought of Roosevelt if Norbeck hadn't suggested it. <laughs> Mostly because I fell into the common trap of ruling out a monument to anyone who died so recently. But that's the kind of hogwash I heard as a kid in Iowa. Who says we have to wait a century before we can honor the memory of a great man? Who says we have to wait a decade, a year, a day? No one. Who? You have a way of stopping an argument before I can start one. Oh, how can I argue with you when I feel I failed you? Failed me? Yes, I failed the artist. I proposed the ideas, and I failed to come up with the money. You've only been at it a year and a half. And you're past 60. At my age, Michelangelo had 30 years of carving left in him. Yeah, well, I just pray that marble dust is the secret to longevity. Because even with these new incentives you've given me, I still see a delay of at least a year before we can get our financing. And it won't be a wasted year. I'm going to make some crude measurements at Rushmore and do some preliminary models. Oh, and there's another thing. I happen to be older than you, and Norbeck's older than the both of us. I'll send you each some marble dust. Oh, you... This is a celebration, Robinson. You seem so reflective. Oh, I was recalling that night two years ago when we were driving along together. And you decided you had failed me. Yeah, I sometimes think I still that. Are you forgetting the reason Senator Norbeck is giving this party? Oh, well, hardly. But getting the federal government to allow $250,000 is only half the battle. A very impressive half, Robinson. Yeah. I believe the saying is, uh, that's good for openers. <laughs> Openers like that, and I'd pull the four races. You know, <laughs> the mayor of one of our Black Hills towns felt certain that he'd raised fifteen thousand dollars the last month. Well, you know how much he got? Uh-huh. One thousand nine hundred. This is a party, gentlemen. You're supposed to mingle. Oh, and it's a wonderful party, Senator. Oh, uh, you know Major Jesse Tucker, Mr. Borgman's assistant and engineer. Uh, a pleasure, sir. How do you do? Sir? But if you think I'm going to stand here and talk about statues when some of the prettiest girls in the Dakotas are here... As well as our wives have all found themselves dancing partners. Mm-hmm. Turnabout is fair play. And now that's a good quote so long as women aren't involved. Well, since I can't persuade you, I might as well tell you the good news I received a few hours ago. Oh, well, now, go slowly, Senator. We're very unaccustomed to good news. Yes. President Coolidge has decided to spend the summer here in the Black Hills. Oh, that's marvelous. That is good news. Why? Is he good with a chisel? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, as you know, Senator, Mr. Borglum has no patience with the politics of the problem. Gutson, don't you see? His presence here will focus the whole nation's attention to the Black Hills. Uh -huh. Inevitably, Mount Rushmore has to be publicized, you know. Publicity. The secret behind fundraising. Of course, of course. I personally offered to do a bust of him or a strike a medal. It's just so blamed infuriating to realize what we have to go through to give dimension to a dream. Uh, <clears throat> you may have to go through a little more. Hmm? Oh, Senator Norbeck. Oh, oh, what a perfectly charming party. Oh, I don't think I've ever met... Oh, oh you. Mrs. Jackson, I retain the right to be me. Perhaps you can persuade your newspaper husband to go on a crusade against that. It may not be necessary, in view of the fact that you have only half the budget your monstrous project requires. Some uh, new guests have just arrived. Uh, if you'll excuse me. Uh, may I propose that the hatchet be buried? And may I propose where we bury it? You never did go on that diet, Mrs. Jackson. <laughs> I, I, I think my wife is calling me. Come in, uh, excuse Jesse me. never could stand the sight of blood. I've been wondering, Mr. Borglim. Glum. <laughs> yes. I've been wondering, with only half the money, are we to have a Washington with only one eye, a Lincoln with one ear, etc., etc., etc.? Robinson, this is a frightful decade for prohibition to be the law of the land. Uh, perhaps, Mrs. Jackson, you haven't heard the good news. Good news? What good news? President Coolidge is summering here. And, uh, and uh, it's while he's honoring us with his presence that the first drilling on Mount Rushmore will begin. The four faces are virtually a reality. I... Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, you look pale, Mrs. Jackson. May I get you a punch? I think she's just had one. Right in the solar plexus. <laughs> Borglum, a very happy New Year to you. May 1928 see the beginning of both our dreams. I'll drink to that. I think I can finish Washington before the year is out. Uh, <laughs> we still have a problem. The federal funds, while they were voted in, the funds themselves haven't been authorized. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you, members of the Mount Rushmore National Memorial Commission, to my humble log cabin studio. As you know, rather appropriately, it was on Washington's birthday, February 22, 1929, that funds were provided so I can carry on with the memorial. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to the picture window over here. Uh, Lincoln, would you draw back the blinds, please? As you can see, the face of Washington is beginning to emerge. I think, gentlemen, if you can, the face is the dimensions of a five-story building carved on a mountain peak where clouds fold about them like a great scarf and the moon hides behind a lock of hair. If I can discover these faces of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt within that mountain, they will, according to geologists, remain to tell the story of America for the next five million years. That, I pray God, will be my legacy to America. This 4th of July, 1930, will not only be a memorable one for those of us here gathered to dedicate this first to the four faces on Mount Rushmore, George Washington. But the very soul of this moment will here linger to be sensed by the millions who in time will come to view this cultural wonder. The authority of the Congress to carve colossal portraits of these great men in the granite of the Bottom Hill. Portland. Has hmm? created a what perpetual Look. shrine Look up there. for political what? democracy. Where? On Washington's nose. What about it? A promise to Somebody all Americans. Somebody is America. climbing down Washington's nose. A promise nose. to yes, the I glory know. of our great nation. It's a girl. The ravages My of daughter. Gutman, it's New Year's Eve. <laughs> you shouldn't be sitting there just 
staring out into the blackness. Yeah, it's too cold to work. It's against the law to get drunk. And Lincoln is sparking with that girl. Well, dear, he is 20 years old. But did it have to be Myra Jackson's daughter? Oh, things aren't all that bad. They've built a beautiful scenic road so that people can view the monument. Lincoln's working with you now and doing so well. The benefit concert that Mary Garden did in Rapid City has helped a lot in the financing. Mary, this is 1932, or it will be in a few hours. Depression. That'll be the key word this year. Things were so bad last year, I had to put my own money in to keep things going. What do you think it's going to be like this year? Slow, perhaps. But it will be done. <laughs> I know it. I'd just like to live to see it. Well, Lincoln... Your eyes are better than mine. Perfect. Mm, yes, it's perfect. Here, Dad, take the binoculars. Mm. All that waste because of one engineer who wouldn't listen to me. Jefferson's head could have been finished instead of just starting. Bigger charges, he said. Bigger charges and we can move faster. That pompous fool. He blew 20 feet off of Jefferson's forehead. The minute I turned my back, he had to prove his point. Can't these men on the dynamite understand, Lincoln? Once rock is blasted away, it's gone forever. From now on... No more chance. Well, it seemed to me to go all right. It's easy to destroy beauty, Robinson. Mm. Didn't expect to see you here today, Mr. Robinson. Well, I come in my usual capacity. We're out of money. I once read the human animal was very adaptable. I think you'd be used to that by now, Borgo. What's the matter with people? You'd think culture was a dirty word. Now, there must be enough blood in the national turnip to pay the workers we need here. Don't they realize that in the last 12 months alone, 150,000 people came to view this unfinished work? Aren't you on something of a speaking basis with President Roosevelt? Why don't you go and talk to him? And what do I say? How about you and Eleanor dipping into the household budget, Franklin, old Point boy? Point out to him that this is not merely a South Dakota project. It's a national project. That's true, Dad. Oh, and there's uh, Alvin Barkley. Yeah, he's a good friend of yours. Well? If you can get the president, Senator Barkley, and a few more enthused about this, and with Norbeck's determination to see this thing through, I'm certain that we'll get another federal grant. All right. I'll try. Good. But I'm not going after a grant that has to be matched with private funds because they just don't exist. Well, now, wait. I think that's possible. There's always hope. Lincoln, you want to make the trip with me? Well, I, I think I can do more good here. I know. I know. You wouldn't want to be that far away from the Jackson girl. Her? Well, we broke up months ago. You... <laughs> well, Robinson, you're right. There is always hope. Ladies and gentlemen, on this 30th day of August, 1936, we're broadcasting to you directly from the site of Mount Rushmore, where in just moments, the second of the four faces will be dedicated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's a setting of spectacular beauty. A 70-foot American flag is draped over the mountain, covering the now-completed face of Thomas Jefferson. To one side is the Washington face, and to the other, we can already recognize the Lincoln face which will probably be dedicated in another year or two. We're situated 1,500 feet below the top of Mount Rushmore. About 100 feet from where I'm broadcasting, the great sculptor of this monumental work, John Gutson Borglum, is standing with his lovely daughter. She's holding a small American flag. And yes, yes, now she's waving it toward the top of the mountain, where Borglum's son and assistant, Lincoln Borglum, has been awaiting the signal. Any second now, he should... I'm sure you all heard it. Lincoln Borglum has set off one of the great blasts needed to start work on the Theodore Roosevelt face. And now, there's a cloud of dust settling in the valley. And there it is. The huge flat is being swung away, and we can see the Jefferson face. it been now, Robinson? Uh, uh, let me see. We dedicated the Lincoln Head in September of uh, 37 and 38. I can't rightly recall. I think it was 38. And then 
Teddy Roosevelt in... Uh, what month was that, Lincoln? July 2nd, 1939. Yeah, that's about two years ago. I put count in the years and I reached my 80th birthday. Now, don't you worry while I'm gone, Robinson. Lincoln knows as much about polishing the heads as I do. He'll put on the finishing touches before the year is out. We're still just a milk run. Better get you on that train, Dad. Coming. I wonder... I wonder if that geologist was right. Huh? Uh, what geologist? The one who said the memorial should last five million years. Come on, Dad. Come on. Up you go. All right. I'm on. Here. Give me my bags. Here you are. Now... Do you mind what I taught you, son? Just you remember that my legacy you're polishing has to last five million years. A million years from now, who's going to care how long it took you to polish Teddy Roosevelt's mustache? So do it right, son. Do it right. Well, now the least he could have done was say goodbye. I think he was afraid to. Afraid? You know something about this Chicago trip I don't? It's for an operation. Oh, it's nothing major. If he feels he'll never live through it. But the memorial will be finished. And it will be a monument to my father's greatness. As well as to the greatness of our nation. Borglum's own words can best conclude this tribute. In 1940... When as many as 10,000 people in a day came to admire his story of the growth and expansion of our nation, he wrote, My dream has come true. There on the mountaintop, as near to heaven as we could make it, we've carved portraits of our leaders that posterity and civilization may see hundreds of thousands of years hence what manner of men our leaders were, with a prayer and a belief that there among the clouds they may stand forever where wind and rain alone shall wear them away. You have been listening to another portrait in an American gallery. Today, John Gutson Borglum, sculptor, starring Ed Begley as Gutson Borglum. Featured in the cast were Kyle Johnson, Bill Boucher, Diana Hale, Jerry Hausner, Frederick Warlock, and Steve Franken. Sound by Gene Twombly. The story was written by Robert M. Young, produced and directed by William Lally. Art Ballinger speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.